folks, we have our Patreon crowdcast this week. Joining us is Simon Roper, PhD student at the University of Central Lancashire. Master, master student, not PhD. Master student, excuse me. <laughs> graduate sorry. student, graduate student at the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, am I missing some shibboleth pronunciation there? <laughs> no, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> like I always feel like I, I'm, I'm always sort of wary with place names in England because it's like, I know what this yeah. looks like to me and then it's going to end up being like five syllables less than I think it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, why don't you uh, introduce yourself uh, for everyone? Give us, you know, kind of a quick tour of your interest in uh, archaeology and Old English and what brought you to YouTube. Okay. Um, well, I'm not um, a linguist by qualification. So as, as Jackson said, I'm doing a, a master's in archaeology. Um, but I think my interest in linguistics, is, it's hard to place exactly where it started, but I think it probably came from the dialect angle because I have grandparents or, well, one grandparent now that speaks in a sort of far northwestern dialect and I have one um, great aunt that speaks in a very far uh, southwestern dialect and it, it, it interested me as a child that they spoke so differently from me um, and I suppose I just wondered where all that came from and then from the archaeology angle I think I got into it through paleoanthropology um, through the study of ancient humans which I'm by no means um, well informed on I think I, I did one one or two modules in it at university which have now finished but apart from that it's just a casual interest um, and I suppose that combined to uh, to form an interest in historical linguistics so um, hmm particularly Old English, I think, because um, a lot of us, I think, are drawn to uh, the language that we speak or some, something to do with some past iteration of something we do or some past iteration of our own behaviour. So Old English was interesting just because it, it seemed so different from Modern English. Um, and yet, you know, as, as recently as a thousand years ago, which is really not, not all that many generations in the grand scheme of things, we were talking in this extremely different way. Um, so I then kind of went down the line of wanting to um, suck out as much um, minute detail from that as as was possible because I think that that's why a lot of people get into um, archaeology because it's it's the kind of minutiae of, of everyday life it's just things people have dropped for, for the most part and things people have mm. sort of thrown down a well or something like that and it's just that that connection between individual in the present and individual in the past. So I wanted to know all this kind of intimate detail about the language and how um, exactly how things were pronounced on a phonetic level um, and things like that, which is not not always possible. And indeed, in many cases, it's, it's not possible. Um, but I think that's that's what made me try to make that video um, a while ago, which was a conversation in Old English. Um, where I tried to sort of calc in um, contractions and things from German and from later English dialects that you see in the sort of 15 and 1600s um, mm. written down uh, because I wanted to make it seem as naturalistic as possible uh, even though of course conversational Old English is not something you have much access to through texts um, right. so now I, I try and keep it more to the kind of what we do have access to through texts and what we can ascertain from texts just so it's you know because I don't know. There's a lot of potential for reconstructions to, to fill gaps by kind of, um, I suppose, fantasizing about features that, that we think would sound cool in Old English or something like that. So I try and stick to what's, what's evidenced in texts now. Um, well, yeah. I think I think that's responsible, but I think there's also a place for, for something like what you're talking about and something like what we've talked about recently yeah, uh, doing, doing together. Um, the, you know, I think it's too often people are tempted to try to make dead languages stiffer, which there's probably a terrible yeah. pun I could make there. <laughs> um, but surely people spoke in casual, you know, casual ways that didn't sound like they were reading a George Lucas script all the time. Yeah. And um, I think that it's worth kind of... Uh, uh, what's uh, maybe reconstruct is not quite the right word, but but to me, I guess I guess here's another thought that kind of connects back to this. Archaeologists look at f 
the quote unquote fossils of the human past, but linguistics can kind of find the trace fossils of the ancient past, right? You know, like the dinosaur footprints, as it were, of the dinosaur that is the material culture. And I think that, you know, it can help us get a better sense of that living culture than just the material remains can. But we also have to remember that it was a flesh and blood living culture, not just a skeleton. Yeah. All right. Now I'm rambling, but um, my, my dinosaur analogy is, is, is bad, but no, I like uh, <laughs> But it's something that occurred to me there. And, and I wanted to ask you a question, actually, from the, the, the beginning of what you said in your intro there. Um, did you notice any cool uh, through lines between Old English and the dialects of English in your family that had fascinated you growing up? Um, I don't think I noticed anything specific. I think one thing, um, one thing that a lot of people point out about Northern English dialects and Scots and things like that is um, that there's a monophonal or slightly slightly more monophonal pronunciation of the um, the mouth vowel. So rather than mouth, it's something like moose or something along those lines, mm. um, which is which is I suppose like a continuation, um, just because the uh, the back vowels weren't quite as effective in the north as they were in the south. But but beyond that, I, I don't think I made any connections until until maybe later on, um, phonologically. Yeah, that, that of course, is a big part of what people uh, make fun of if they put on a sort of stereotypical Scots accent, yeah. if they call it Scots. Um, yeah. I have some distant, distant relatives who speak Scots, mm. and uh, it is much more elaborate than just saying coo for cow. <laughs> yeah. There's a... I'm actually a member now of the Scots Lead Associate, which Are sends you? out yeah they send out this whole newsletter in Scots. It's it's really, I mean heck, it's more different than Swedish and Norwegian. Yeah, I was going to say like, um, in terms of sort of, if a, if an English speaker wants to get a sense of what a dialect continuum feels like, then Scots is a good a good example of something to turn to. Um, I don't have much experience of it myself beyond beyond that Northwestern dialects are kind of similar to Scots. Um, but can you make a lot of sense of it yourself? Are you, are you kind of, have you attuned to it? Or, or does the Scandinavian element help at all? Or is it like just... The Scandinavian helps. Um, actually, the Scandinavian element helps a lot with Doric, with speakers around Aberdeen. Okay. That sounds really Norwegian to me. I'm sure I'd feel even more that way if I managed to make it to Shetland or Orkney. But yeah. um, I always felt like that was was pretty helpful. In fact, sometimes sitting in Scotland, just hearing people, you know, just overhearing someone at another table or something, you can almost think you're hearing Norwegian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's sometimes that similar intonation. And that kind of super segmental thing is actually one of the hardest things to reconstruct about an ancient language, by the way. I mean, we don't necessarily know what the sort of super segmentals of English, Old English or Old Norse were. Um, you know, that's, that's a really vexing question. Yeah. So by the way, we, we alluded to something we were working on together and, um, what we're, what we're putting together. And I feel like I can say this on Patreon, um, yeah. is, um, we're trying to create a video where Simon and I will speak to each other, him and old English and me and old Norse in hopefully roughly the same period of those languages. So I'm not going to be using like classical old Icelandic. I'm kind of aiming at maybe like circa 1000 old Danish, old, old Norwegian mm. and trying to kind of like demonstrate the uh, possibilities for mutual intelligibility. Yeah. And what, what we're trying to do is make this actually seem really casual, right? It's not going to be uh, uh, like I said, <laughs> my go-to demonstration is like, is it's not going to be a George Lucas script. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's not going to be. That, that's the thing about this, the kind of stiltedness that people normally pronounce these things with, which is yeah. which is good for, um, good for demonstrating, I suppose the. Maybe it's good for demonstrating the phonology and like the most common phonetic realizations. But when people actually talk to each other, um, they talk quickly and they. I don't know. Yeah, the prosody is actually going to be a really interesting thing there, because I, I always, I don't know, as you say, it's really hard to reconstruct things like um, beyond just which which syllables are stressed and which syllables aren't stressed. Things like yeah. um, 
the exact intonation of certain phrases and things like that differ from dialect to dialect. And in, in the Scandinavian languages, that's kind of complicated by the, um, what do you call it, pitch accent? Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I, I can do if I'm really, really thinking about it, but it's difficult to do on the fly. Um, yeah. You know, if you're not a native speaker, that's difficult to, to imitate, right? And then, you know, individual people can have really weird super segmentals too. Um, yeah. You know, I'm sure that's actually part of what people complain about in my particular delivery is my friend Luke Gordon, who teaches at the University of New Mexico, says my super segmentals are just the weirdest on the planet. He says he like he cannot figure out why I talk the way I talk, um, you know, beyond phonology. And I'm, I'm sure that's part of what drives people crazy. Um, but I'm sure it's also not old Norse. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll try to imitate a Norwegian super segmentals a little bit better for for our conversation. We'll see if I can memorize the script well enough for that. Yeah, I, <laughs> think I can they, focus on that. I've been trying to um, make this old English kind of short film kind of thing um, while lockdown's been on and while while because um, in the in the UK there's this lockdown. Um, which has been made hard by the fact that sometimes you can't, you're not really supposed to go out and do things. But um, one thing I wanted to try and um, I suppose aim for in some respect was was that intonation thing. Because although Old English didn't have pitch accent, to the best of our knowledge, um, I, I was sort of going through old dialect recordings and, and you know, Prat, the speech analysis software. Um, I was trying to, because you can sort of, um, there's a tool where you can get the intonation and it will sort of give you a line um, following the intonation. So I was, I was looking at that and I was trying to find patterns and try like see if I could triangulate something that sounded um, mm. roughly right, but I've got no idea how, you, how I would go about doing that because I don't know the basics of um, how intonation works and how certain patterns of intonation sort of map onto each other and things. So I don't oh, know it's... if that will come up that, but... It's a hard and specialized study. And, and you know, this stuff with ancient languages is so hard to figure out. I mean, we don't even really know if Old Norse had a pitch accent like Swedish and Norwegian do. Right. A lot of people think it did because the Danish the patterns like the tones in Swedish and Norwegian. But okay. then Icelandic and Faroese and then a lot of, like, Northern Norwegian, Swedish and Finnish Swedish don't have any of that. So... You know, it also kind of looks like maybe it's something that developed in the center and spread out later okay. and never made it to the margins. We just don't know. Um, you know, that <laughs> stuff is all so speculative. And, and it's hard without finding outsiders who say something like they sound like they're singing. <laughs> yeah. Which, which sometimes you can get, right? Because you, you have early modern Swedes who complain about how the Danes sound like they have something in their throats. Yeah. And we say, okay, well, that's stud. That's, that's where yeah. that's... That's when that's developing, but we don't have anything like that. You know, the, the, the Irish and the English and the French talking about the Vikings rating. Don't mention that they sound sing songy or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> oh, oh, well. And, yeah, you know, like they were focused on other things and we, we have to, we have to give them credit for, you it's know, like taking a spiteful when well, you could mention that, but okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. It'd be <laughs> sing songy. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Sometimes I'm amazed by the things that did come out of that period. I mean, like stuff like the hostage stone, um, you know. I didn't know the, about the hostage stone. Oh, it's this cool. Um, I want to say, I want to say it's from Ireland. It's uh, just this scratched picture in a rock of Vikings leading this priest away. Okay. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, it's really it's it's yeah. kind of neat. I mean, obviously, it comes from someone's bad experience. But, uh, well, yeah. yeah, you know, sometimes people stopped and did stuff. And by the way, everybody, feel free to chime in with questions, um, remarks, anything you want to throw in there about uh, Old English Archaeology, Simon's work, um, or YouTube. <laughs> or YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Which we were just talking about before this about in how, the, in the, yeah, yeah in, our, in our little prep room about how we can't quite figure out what works on YouTube and what doesn't, I'm... No, yeah. Or what so you use? Sorry. Because I was going to say, I mean, you know, I was looking at, at your videos and I was trying to organize it by, by views and you have some that are just hundreds of thousands. 
right? It's, it's a weird kind of tra not trajectory, like a weird pattern from one to the to the from from the lowest to the the most. I'm not sure what the pattern is really. Yeah, I'll post two videos that I think are roughly the same appeal or what have you, and and one, you know, soars, and then and the next one just, yeah, you know, nothing ever happens to it. Um, got some questions out here in the ask a question section. Um, so let's see, Brittany asks, uh, as an undergrad student about to go through a field school, I have a mind to go for my master's in archaeology, but want to specialize particularly in some linguistic elements and old Scandinavian history if possible. I'm a weird interdisciplinary major currently. Are there institutions better suited than others that I should consider studying at? Um, it depend on which country you're in. Yeah, that would depend on the country, I think. But um, within the UK, I'm not sure if I know of anyone personally who's doing both. I think most, most universities will allow you to take um, electives on some level where you can kind of do one or two classes in uh, a, a field of your choice and then kind of have that as part of your qualification. But I'm not, I, I've not looked for specifically um, linguistics and archaeology in the same course. Although I think, I don't know, may, maybe the fact that um, in the US archaeology is treated much more as a subdiscipline of anthropology and I think linguistics is as well, isn't it? So um, depends. That, that might be, yeah, that might, might be more conducive to it. Yeah, my experience at a lot of universities, and I can specifically mention Wisconsin, UCLA, and Colorado, where there was some archaeology going on, or some people who would have something to do with archaeology in, say, Northwestern Europe, was mm -hmm. that the people in the language departments didn't even know those people. Like, like they didn't it, know the the people within their own no, I mean, typically there was just almost no cross pollination that i ever saw um in old norse studies this sometimes crosses the line but typically archaeology journal archaeology journals publish archaeology articles language journals publish language articles and these two yeah. just don't cross that much um you know myself i'm very much on the language side of things i can't think of any university where there's anybody particularly working on any language archaeology crossover. Um, but I trust that if you wanted to do something like that, probably the best thing to do would be to find a good archaeology program at a university that had the languages you were interested in and take the languages as electives or as language credits. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good shout. Um, let's see. This could go a lot of ways. Chris asks, what is the relative influence of Anglo-Saxon versus Old Norse on the English we speak today? Um, I, you may have a different view, but I, I think um, the Old Norse has been, um, the Old Norse influence has been more substantial than for example, the French influence, um, but not perhaps on the level of, I, I know there are some suggestions of creolization and things like that. I, I don't think, as far as I know, that there's much evidence of um, widespread creolization between the two languages. But I think definitely, um, I mean, there's a lot of vocabulary from Old Norse that's very cool in English. So things like, I think there's some pronouns which are derived from Old Norse, they and them and things like that, um, which is the kind of thing that you, you don't get from French um, there's a lot of very common everyday words uh, that are derived from Old Norse, like give and get, which again you you don't you don't get from French, although you do you do get words like people, which are from French, I think. Um, so I think it might have been a case of um, if if you were to travel back to a time period where Old Norse and Old English speakers were communicating on a more day to day level in certain parts of the country, you might you might find. Um, you might find that there was more, you might find there were certain varieties of English that were much more influenced than Old Norse, uh, by Old Norse than, than modern varieties are. But perhaps that that influence has been watered down over time by modern varieties that weren't influenced by it, perhaps. Because I think most, most standard varieties um, tend to be from further southeast, um, if you go beyond the Old English period. Uh, although I suppose London I don't know if London was actually in the Dane law or not. It was right on, I know it was right on the cusp of sort of between the two at, at times, but I'm not sure whether it was in it or not. 
I think it's right on the borderline. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think, hang on. Um, oh, I was trying to, I was trying to read the, the, the side thing, but it's going too quickly. It goes fast. <laughs> I think, do, you, do you have any input about that kind of thing? Have you noticed much influence beyond just loan words and things? Well, I think that the loan word thing is really important. You know, people, um, people often point to the sort of misleading statistic that English vocabulary is something like 60% Latin yeah. or romance, which is true if you're looking at the dictionary and counting yeah. entries. But if you're just speaking, you know, out of the thousand words you use the most often, uh, I think the statistic is about a hundred of them are from Old Norse. And they are, like you said, very basic things. Often they, their, them, get, give, ugly, awkward, sister, you know, crazy basic stuff. And I almost think that and, and, and for the Creole thing, that, that got really popular somewhere in the early 2010s because there were a couple popular articles about it. I don't think that it's proper to say that they're Creolized because there's no, even though there's some very basic grammatical function words borrowed, there's not grammatical Creolization. Right, right. Um, and I think the languages are actually too close to Creolize. Like, I, I, I okay. think when you look at a classic Creole situation, you're often talking about you know, French or English or Dutch and a Caribbean language or something like that, where there's a completely different structure. Children are growing up with completely different inputs and they're coming up with a completely different scaffolding to put those different inputs onto. Yeah. With Old English and Old Norse, you know, it would be like, to go back to the Scots example, I think it's like, could you produce an English Scots Creole? I don't know what that would mean. Yeah, I think you'd end up, you, you know, I, I think, I think you'd end up with like really Scots sounding English or really English sounding Scots. And, and it's not really a Creole. And so probably what you've got in places like Nottingham, say a thousand years ago is English speakers in such regular contact with Norse speakers that words easily cross the boundaries between them. There's regular, a regular expectation that people understand both. But you're speaking one or the other. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so right. I've seen videos before. There's the, the correspondences are fairly regular. Um, so if you, if you got used to them, you could you could kind of get to the point of being able to understand it. Maybe maybe as though it were a really really thick accent, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's quite on that level. I'm not sure how um, how much we have the vocabulary. To yeah. We have to experimentally demonstrate this, <laughs> but I think you could, I think you could figure out things like hame, home, stain, stone. I mean, yeah. bane, bone. That 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 doesn't take linguistic genius to figure out if people are speaking this language around you all the time. And, mm -hmm. but I still think that that contributes more toward the two separate language communities understanding one another than blending. And and I mean. You know, consider that creoles arise in a pretty specific, pigeons creoles arise in a pretty specific situation, um, which I don't think you have in Eastern England. Um, I think you probably have these language communities being a little bit separate, even if neighboring for a pretty long time. Yeah. Auburn, uh, I've gotten the impression that it's unlikely that anything new and substantive in Old Norse will be found in the future, like new sources, texts. Um, is Old English the same in the same situation, or are new writings and inscriptions found? Um, I'm not sure if I've I'm not sure if I've heard of any new um, writings being found. I mean, it's always possible that something's buried away um, that that people haven't sort of dug up yet. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if I've heard of anything happening recently, although there might be something obvious that I'm missing. Um, I can't think of anything. There's the occasional random inscription. Yeah, yeah. But those yeah, seem like, to be like five letters. Yeah, yeah. Something that you couldn't interpret. That's just, you know, one of those inscriptions that's just like 
or like something like that. Just yeah, right, a right, string right. of rough letters that, that we can't. Um, if 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 somebody would be courteous enough to like uh, dig out of some library an old English text where it's it's gone really specifically into the mechanical phonetics of old English, that would be really helpful. But I don't know. Yeah. If it will. You get you yeah, get you don't. Like, yeah, from like the seventeenth century, but. Hang on, I'm going to turn this. You don't up. have uh, you don't have the uh, the first grammatical treatise, which we have from Iceland from about 1140. No, we don't. We have the Ormulum, which is a very <laughs> very, very poor <laughs> substitute for it. But is this making me look really orange? I'll turn. Look it a little orange. Yeah. yeah, the Ar the Ormulum is also kind of boring. Um, it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that is an unfortunate uh, tool to have to, to, to turn to. But yeah, like. And then often the new inscriptions will be like it's half of a word or it's half of two words, and you can't really figure out, you know, because yeah. <laughs> you just get like a pottery shard or something. Yeah, it's and unfortunately there's not cool new inscription finds very often. Here's here's one I'm interested in your your answer about particularly. Silky asks, does the pressure to make videos, especially videos that do well? sometimes make your interest or hobby into a chore at times maybe expectations of viewers as opposed to self-motivated creation um i think it sort of sometimes i notice it kind of slipping into that territory like i think there, there was a, a period where i sort of went through um i decided that it would be a good idea to kind of punctuate things so that if i released an old english video one week, then I'd try and release a, an anthropology video the next week, and I wouldn't try and release too many videos on the same in the same kind of area, two in a row. Um, and I thought that was getting a bit um, pressurised, but but it's not. I don't think at this point that it's that it's that bad because I um, I'm lucky enough that nobody generally complains about videos. I assume if they don't want to watch them, then they just kind of click off them. Um, wow. Although, <laughs> well, I'm, like, there are there are complaints and things, but they're, they're generally, um, if, if there are complaints, then they're worded aggressively enough that I can can just kind of internally dismiss them. <laughs> just sure. See what I mean. Like, and then a lot of things go to the. Do you know the box on YouTube where they they send the things that that they flagged up as potentially worthy of, I, I don't normally check that. Um, so there might be things in there that I've not, uh, that I've not noticed. Um, yeah. YouTube is that I also don't really understand how that algorithm works. <laughs> no, no, there, there are people, um, who, who sort of, who comment really, um, what's the word really quite insightful, nice comments. And then they'll they'll say at the bottom, hopefully this doesn't get deleted like my last six comments did or something. And then I'll check the box, and there'll be a load of nice comments from them. And it'll just, for some reason they'll just put them in the box, um, yeah, which is a shame. Maybe I should check it more. But. Well, yeah, I mean for me, I go through phases about this. Right, there's times when I get depressed about the whole venture. I'm like, this YouTube channel is about to collapse. And I'm, yeah. all my patrons are going to leave me, and I don't know why I do this. But I make videos far enough in advance that usually there's no sign that that period happened. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. And um, you know, right now with just tons of projects going on, um, YouTube is usually actually like the fun work that I do. Right, yeah. because I get to go up into the mountains. I get to go somewhere pretty. Um, I get to talk about something that's interesting that I know interests somebody. Right. Yeah. Um, to me, and and I enjoy teaching. And to me, it's very parallel to teaching. So it's actually, um, I, I I've mostly been more happy with it <laughs> lately, just because it is like the fun the fun work. I'm glad um, to hear. <laughs> yeah, I am too. <laughs> um, Mace asks about the influence of Celtic languages on Old English. Do you have anything to say about that? It's, it's a very um, kind of fiercely debated thing. I think I used to... It's one of those things where there's kind of... Most people probably fall um, relatively 
in the middle of the spectrum, but then there are sort of two kind of bins that it's easy to fall into either side, where one bin is like all these features are from Celtic and they just didn't surface in writing for ages, like for example, um, I think do support exists in some Celtic mm. <coughs> languages. So um, for example, do you want some bread instead of want you some bread, that kind of construction, I think some people have suggested is a, a Celtic, a mark of Celtic influence. But then you, you don't really get that construction in English texts at the same time as Celtic languages are widely spoken throughout Britain. Hang on. <coughs> Sorry. Sure. Um, so I, I used to fall into the kind of bin of no, there's no Celtic influence at all. This is all just conspiracy theories or something like that. But I think maybe that was me um, kind of being too rea reactionary to the to the suggestion. So there might well be some kind of Celtic influence. I think things like do support, I, I personally find it hard to believe that um, they could be so stigmatized that they went something like 600 years or 500 years maybe not being written down in texts um, and then then kind of surface in text later on but it's possible it's possible um, and I don't see how else it could have arisen to be fair I don't I, I don't know if there's any other hypotheses there. I don't know and, and I think the question actually is interesting because of the specific way it was phrased here on old English because it is a different question if this Celtic yeah. influence on old English than if this Celtic influence on present day English <laughs> right. I, I think what's kind of fascinating, in fact, is that there's probably more Celtic loan words in Old English, although there's still never many. But there's possibly a little bit more of the if if things like do support. Um, another suggestion is the progressive tenses. I am yeah. doing, I was doing. Um, if that is due to Celtic influence, it's interesting that that shows up in modern English and not in Old English. That's um, true. Yeah, because, because the loan words are like cross and dad, right? I mean, like that's yeah, that's that's I, about the most Celtic think, vocabulary. I use the word bin a lot. I think bin might actually be a Celtic loan word as well. Come to think huh. of it, but I'm not sure. We'd have to somebody would have to check that. But but yeah, but yeah, there's oh, a few loan words in modern English. But yeah, as as you say, um, because another thing is the distribution of um, prestige dialects in Old English was slightly different than it is in modern English. So. West Saxon Old English um, is probably not the ancestor of most features of modern standard English. Rock. I think I think Mercian the Mercian features tend to um, tend to be, become more associated with prestige dialects as as they developed into Middle English. Um, so it's it's possible that there's influence on, for example, something like influence on West Saxon that was then. Um, minimized as <coughs> sorry as uh, mercy and features became more and more prestige or associated with prestige dialects and when i say mercy and features i mean the kind of descendants of mercy and features um, right that's an interesting question because you might actually expect more contact with with welsh or cumbrian or something like that in mercia than in west saxon but in west saxon you yeah, might expect yeah. some contact with cornish but it's not as if these would be prestige contacts, right? That's it would be antagonistic or, yeah, you know. That, that's the thing, because <clears throat> these kinds of things often um, radiate, radiate out from kind of centers of influence. And as you say, that's normally because the center of influence speaks a dialect, which is in some way kind of prestige, whether it's a standard dialect or whether it's just something people for, for whatever reason socially think is is worth imitating um and it's not necessarily deliberate imitation so the idea that i'm not i'm not sure if there's anything in those celtic areas um that you would think of as a, a center of influence um but there must be other ways of of things like that transmitting though i still wonder about it with uh, the grammatical influence because you look at something like the progressive tenses and as far as Germanic languages go, that's only a regular thing in English and Icelandic, which are exactly the Germanic languages that would be in the most contact with Celtic. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I've lived much of my life in close contact with 
Spanish or even, you know, Arapaho, which are very, very different from English. And if I borrow a word, I never think about borrowing like a grammatical construction, right? Like I don't, I, I, I can't imagine a situation in which something like say the Spanish gender distinction leaks into English. You know what yeah. I mean? Like uh, it's just yeah. it's just strange to think what is the mechanism that would happen by. I think maybe um, maybe something like a sentence construction would would find it easier to to make its way in, just because in order for for gender to make its way in, you'd need some kind of um, thing for it to be manifested in. So like word endings or something that we don't really have necessarily right. anymore. But but then I, I could kind of imagine. Um, it's a silly example, but I'm, I remember in my first year of university, I was friends with a lot of um, Spanish, um, not exchange students, but people who come over from Spain for a year, um, just through an accident of who I live with. And I sometimes found myself, because they would speak English, but sometimes when you're speaking a second language, you kind of calc constructions mm-hmm. from your first language into the second language, because um, you don't know that that's not the most natural way of saying it to a native speaker of the other language. So you could imagine if there were loads of speakers of a Celtic language doing that, then somebody, a native English speaker living among them, might kind of pick that up as a substrate feature just because we pick things up from the people around us. Um, Possible. Still, I don't, I don't see how that would transmit widely, if you see what I mean. Um, no, but, but that's, but that's yeah. the most plausible scenario, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a it's an interesting question that is that deserves a lot of a lot of consideration uh john phillips asked do we find old english inscriptions far afield like the old norse inscription in the hagia sophia i'm not aware of any um i think er- early on it would be difficult to tell because anything that looked west germanic um could just anything that looked West Germanic with some features of prehistoric Old English could be um, just another West Germanic dialect that that happened to also develop those features. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of anything later on, but I, I might have missed, I may could easily have missed something. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything, any traces of Old English specifically outside of the British Isles. How, it would how, be... Sorry. It would be hard to con- to to tell apart from Frisian early on. Absolutely, yeah. If it was found in that area of Europe, um, yeah, as you say, Frisian had a lot of the same developments, um, vowel-wise as well. Um, mm. So fronting of certain vowels and things like that. But yeah, what what's the how far afield was the one they they referenced the comment they referenced? The Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. There's some runic oh, graffiti right. from. Okay. Ranging guardsman, probably. It's kind of fun. That's very nice. That's very nice indeed. Yeah, Old Norse got around. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise, um, culturally. And, you know, then there's all those, if you want to get into the super speculative stuff, there's all the stuff about like Old English being on the Black Sea because of um, the guy who left England after the Norman conquest. And anyway, who knows about all that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> See, Theon asks about uh, Skadi and uh, Angerboda and their lineage. So, a quick Old Norse question. Um, I don't think there's anything about Angerboda's lineage anywhere. And Skadi is the daughter of Thiazzi, a giant or Yotun. Um, the story of how she came to live among the gods, I think I actually told in a video about Skadi uh, that you might look at. Um, and then there's a question from Chris. Uh, down here that I think actually connects to like two questions ago. Um, pretty interesting and, and somewhat contentious question. Did Anglo-Saxon replace Brythonic or was it mainly replacing Latin through the fifth and sixth centuries? Um, I think I think it more replaced um, Brythonic. Um, there may be evidence to the contrary. Um, I, I think Romano-British people uh, mostly s- still spoke Platonic, although I could be wrong. Um, and and on that note, I think that um, to my understand, I'm, I'm reluctant to say anything because I'm not I'm not sure if I can back it up with anything. This is just from experience working on a um, a Roman fort in uh, Lancashire, and 
being told things by um, uh, colleagues who, who are from the US and who had researched it a little bit. But um, I think people, there's evidence of people in forts speaking whatever language was uh, common in the place they came from. So for example, if Sarmatians were in, were in a fort somewhere else, they might speak their own language and so on. Mm. So I'm not sure if that kind of influence would, would have impressed Latin onto the general population either. Um, so I, I think, I mean, there's um, there's a part in, um, I think it's actually towards the start of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle where it uh, goes through the languages which are spoken in England, the Yathilda, which is spoken in England. And I think it lists six, um, which are, if I remember, I think they're English, Scottish, British, Pictish, Welsh, and um, Book Latin, or Cleden. So yeah. it, it, it implies, I think, that, that Latin is, is I might be re reading it wrong, but I think that implies Latin is kind of ecclesiastical thing, whereas the, the languages we would we would call Celtic are vernacular languages still at that point in the early in the early Anglo-Saxon period. Although I think that that comes from um, that's in reference to the early Anglo-Saxon period coming from a historian that's writing later on. So so whether that's accurate, um, I suppose that's down to whether you believe that particular um, scribe. I think you're right. But I'd pose a follow-up question to you that, that I've always kind of wondered about, which is you look at the traces of early Brythonic, uh, which you could almost call like Proto-Welsh, and um, you look at Gaulish on the continent, and before all those medieval sound changes in Britain, they're not that different. But then in, in France, the vernacular is replaced by the Latin-derived Romance language, but not in Britain. Do you have any thoughts about why? I'm not sure, because I, I think I think there's some ADNA evidence against the idea of a total population replacement in in Britain. So I think there is um, this. This is within the last ten years, but it might now be out of date because that that sort of thing moves very quickly. But I think um, I think most of the population of Britain was probably not replaced. So that 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 poses an issue. Um, of if they weren't replaced, then how did they adopt the language so wholesale without without leaving any um, or without leaving any obvious substrate features on the written language? So I think that's kind of a mystery that's still still being um, picked apart. Um, I'm not I'm not sure much about the, the continental situation with French, um, although it, it is interesting from what I've heard about it. Yeah, I've just wondered if it's population density of, of Roman settlers or something like that. I mean, that that Possibly, maybe yeah. that alone is is all it takes. Um, Silky asks another question here. You both use nature footage <laughs> and are very good at explaining things in an area that way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Have you. you noticed other similarities between the two of you, like something that seems to be a formula that works in common? Well, first of all, we've known each other for like two weeks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I always wanted to get in contact, but I sort of thought, I don't know why, like, what do I, what do I say? Do I just say, we make similar videos, you know, I think your videos are nice. I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not um, totally sure. Because <laughs> um, you, you use... I suppose I use slides, and you use not 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 always slides, but kind of slides that appear to the side, sort of thing. I'm not I'm not sure if that's a maybe that's just a. I suppose that's just necessary for the for the subject matter, isn't it? But it's just an aesthetic thing. And by the way, those actually are slides. Uh, okay. By the way, what I do is I screenshot the video, make that a background in PowerPoint, really? type what I want to type. <laughs> Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I'm such a Neanderthal. I, just, no, no, I don't no. know. To... And I just... Insight into the, the work. That's how... <laughs> That's how it works. And I just crop that out and I just place it back on the video. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, sometimes I'm a total... they're transparent, aren't they? That's quite it... impressive. But that's, that never comes across that they're, they're transparent. And it, it never interferes with things. 
somehow. I mean, it it's, I don't know, you get used to doing things a certain way and you just like, eh, I'm just going to keep doing it this way. I was wondering how uh, much, how much um, people saying you're pronouncing Old Norse wrong did it take for you to start adding the, the disclaimer? Because I never well, went through I, enough to, to, to find, like, I don't know. The disclaimer started way at the beginning, like before any of the videos that are even still up there were up um, because I was just so used to encountering people that would hear me say anything in Old Norse would be like, actually, yeah. it's Halvamal. <laughs> be like, yeah, I, I know, I know, <laughs> I, I know Icelandic. I know it means Halvamal, but... It's like, yeah. yeah. So I just knew that it was something that was always going to bug people. And I just feel like now to me, it's like my elephant whistle, right? I blow this whistle to make the elephant stay away. And have you ever seen an elephant? It's, <laughs> it's like, I, I know like the day that I don't put it there, someone's going to show up and be like, actually, <laughs> my, actually. Yeah, the, the my se it. yeah, my second cousin's girlfriend is an Icelander. And yeah, it's, I don't know. It's like my apotropaic against that evil. I think it's the um, kind of thing kind of happens a little bit with the um, the idea of reconstructing pronunciation of past stages of English because I think uh, initially it's a fair it's a fair question to ask well how can you possibly know how that was pronounced or do you have his written text so so I did a few videos kind of explaining how how that kind of thing is reconstructed um, but you still get people kind of commenting so in other words you're just guessing but <laughs> yeah right but exactly just, yeah. but you know what you or I, who are honest about the fact that we are, you know, reconstructing and, and making estimations based on what we know, we get more grief about it than some dude, you know, with like a biker beard, just shouting at you and telling you, you know, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is how, how everything was back then. This is how it's people like, did things. This is how people, well, yeah, like details yeah. that you couldn't possibly know about and there's, there's perhaps evidence against even. Yeah. And it seems like, I guess the difference is just confidence, right? But it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I'm like, I'm confident about my estimation, but I'm still going to tell you it's an estimation. You yeah. Know? Like, I'm not going to lie to you about it. I mean, you know, maybe if I just decided at some point that I had utter contempt for my audience, I would start lying to them. But then I would have other problems. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, I think that would probably be caused by other problems to begin with. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'll still ask a question I want to hear your answer to. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite old English poem, and if so, why? Um, <clears throat> I, in terms of poems, <clears throat> I really like the Seafarer, um, which is, is it 10th century? Hang on, I'm actually going to check that, just so that I don't get it wrong. It's in the Exeter book, so I suppose that makes it 10th century, yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I like the seafarer just because of the level of um, evocative kind of detail it goes into. Like I think it describes the, the frost gathering around his feet and the, the waves sort of crashing against the rocks and the sounds of the gannets and stuff above his head, which is, I think it's it's interpreted as an elegy. Um, so like him looking back at his life just because of the way it kind of goes from describing his life on the sea to describing this journey to heaven he's going to take. Um, so that's a really, a really nice one. Um, I think I'm I'm most interested in um, things like medical texts and stuff like that, where where there's not so much poetry as um, I don't listen, I suppose that's not even prose, that's just writing. But in terms of poems, I think the Seafarer is a really nice one. That's a good deep cut. Do you recommend yeah. a translation of it for anyone that might be seeking to appreciate it? Um, I can't think the translation I read. I think it was in a book in the university library that I first um, read a translation of it, but I'm not sure. It's in Williamson's uh, Beowulf. Okay. He has an appendix for, for people. So I'll just throw that out there. If, okay. if people want to read that, uh, Williamson's Beowulf actually has a lot of those sort of smaller Old English poems at the end, That's which I think is actually the best thing about that book. Uh, it's a good translation, but but he really seems to have more passion even for the smaller poems and for Beowulf. And I, I like the Seafarer. I like the Wanderer too. I like, yeah, um, I like it as well. They're sort of similar in vibe. Um, 
probably the closest thing to anything like that in Old Norse would be some skaldic poetry, but the skaldic poetry is never that. There has quite that tone. There's something, something unique about those those two in particular. Do you find um, that there's much? Because um, in Old English, sometimes you can get clues about phonemization and things from poetry, like um, k word initially alliterating with ch sometimes suggests because those those both come from k in Proto-Germanic. So, is is there anything in Old Norse that kind of suggests that certain certain phonemes haven't split yet or anything like that. I know it's not necessarily mean that the phonemes mm. haven't split, but like the convention hasn't caught up. But is there, is there anything like that that you're aware of? Well, there's a few things. I mean, actually, because skaldic poetry is so complicated, you get a just a feast, just a buffet of what rhymes and alliterates with everything else. Yeah. Um, I actually used this in a video that I've made uh, that I haven't put up yet about uh, that people ask me about pretty often, did, did Old Norse speakers have a W or a V? Or Old Norse spells V? Because it c clearly comes from our Proto-Germanic W. Yeah. And actually, there's pretty early rhymes where those Vs rhyme with Fs, which spell V in a lot of positions in Old Norse and Old English. So that's that's a, a, an interesting instance of it. Um, there are sometimes times where we're not quite sure if it's a poetic convention or a real sound change that hasn't happened yet. Probably the best yeah. example of that in Old Norse is you umlaut. Um, you umlaut is is ignored in rhymes and Scaldic poetry. Okay. So we don't know if the change hasn't happened or if there's just a convention of ignoring it or just a convention of treating yeah. these two vowels as rhyming even though they don't anymore. That's yeah. That's a really good question that we can't quite answered because it's so consistent. Um, but well into the 1100, Scaldic poets don't rhyme those vowels. So it's like, we know they've got them different. So at what point did it become a convention? <laughs> and at what point yeah. had that change mm -hmm. really not happened? So yeah, sometimes that can actually be pretty pretty tough. Yeah, it's, I think it's the same in Old English. Like it's, it's, There's no guarantee that the that rhyming or alliterating palatalized consonants with velar ones is necessarily um, necessarily means they've phonemicized. Um, and I can't off the top of my head think about, I, I can't think of when the first sound change, because often things phonemicize when another sound change kind of forces them into, uh, forces them out of complementary distribution with each other um, kind of thing. So I, I can't actually think of when they would phonemicize if not. Um, No, sorry, that was just, it's just a no, no. It's, um, there was an example that crossed my mind for a moment and now I'm trying to remember what, what it was that was crossing my mind. Um, oh yeah, but if you think about it in modern English, here's, here's an example for people who, who maybe need a modern English example. The word again, A-G-A-I-N. Now my grandfather said again. Yeah. But almost everybody now says again. But we have a convention in songs that again rhymes with rain. That's true. Or pain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So how many pop songs and there's so many there she goes, there she goes, again running through my brain, right? Treating again and brain like they rhyme, even though the speaker clearly doesn't rhyme them. It like it can kind of bother people, but it's a convention that's obviously just accepted in a lot of yeah. Yeah. pop songwriting. Yeah. I wonder to what extent that's like a spelling thing as well, because like there's a, there's a huge level on which we, um, like I had a conversation with my friend because me me and my friend both speak with a non-rhotic variety, where in a word like car you don't pronounce the r at the end, so you don't, well I, I, you could say phonemically there's still an r there, but it's not car, it's car, right? Just the, right. the complement of the vowel. But he he would insist that there is an r sound there, hmm. even though. Um, he doesn't pronounce it in the same way as he would pronounce the R in red. So I'm, I, I'm never sure if that's him perceiving some underlying phonological thing or just him looking at the spelling and thinking, well, there, there must be an R there. Um, that's possible. And I mean, we, we so over, like, I don't know what the term would be. I'd have to make up a word for it. Maybe we, we <laughs> over scriptize our language. We think it, we analyze language in terms of what it looks like as a written word, but that's in fact not what our subconscious brains are doing. Absolutely. Yeah, like we think of, letters as making sounds right when right 
in reality, that's not really how it works. Although I think maybe maybe there are some situations where a spelling can um, mislead people into pronouncing something differently. But I think that only tends to happen with very rare, rarely used words. Maybe. Like well, there's, there's often, right? Often. Which. Which so, by normal sound change we'd expect often, but a lot of people say often because of the T, yeah. So Yeah. I suppose that it does happen. Often. Yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> As it were. <laughs> um Auburn asks, how has making YouTube videos been received by your academic colleagues? Any difference between reactions from professors versus fellow students or students within your department versus outside your department? Um I think uh, by students, I think they just think it's kind of, broadly speaking, I think that they think it's kind of neat. They think it's just kind of nice that it's amounted to, to, to something. Um, I think it's the same with, with lecturers and things. Like I had one lecture on in a video the other, um, the other week, and I might try and do the same with other, with other lecturers as well, if they're, if they're up for it. Um, I think they, I was worried at first that they might kind of, um, they might disapprove because you get all kinds of sort of pop archaeology people and stuff like that and I'm sure the same is true linguistics who kind of will come and do do a thing that's um, aimed at a sort of broad audience and kind of makes things really reductionist and stuff like that and I, I think as a student it, you have the potential to make a lot of mistakes and stuff like that. So I was worried that they might not not approve, but I think I think they do. They've they've said they've said it's they've said they they like the videos and things like that. So I, I hope hope they do. What about you? That's cool. The, somebody higher up the the ladder. Uh arguably, yeah. It's been more mixed for me. Um, you know, definitely from some tenured colleagues, and it always seems to be tenure tenure track colleagues. There's some just dismissal of it. Like, what a waste of time. You know, why don't you do something important? Like, write an article that 12 people will read. <laughs> um, you know, in a sense that like, this has to be from from probably the most hostile reaction I get is like, this has to be by definition, illegitimate. Because the people who talk to the public about Vikings are all just grifters. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, you, you don't have to be a grifter <laughs> like you yeah. could actually like at, i think i think people some people have such a category of like person who talks to the public about this grifter yeah person like, person yeah. person who stays in the ivory tower pristine scholars like no you can you can not be a grifter and still talk to the public because after all the ivory tower gets more isolated the more you don't talk to the public and soon the public doesn't understand why it's paying for you to have your job um so there's I don't. I don't understand the idea that that if you kind of communicate with the public about it, then then because presumably they know you and they know you're not going to be, you know, shouting pagan charms at people to make the, you know make their lives better or whatever it might be. Like I don't know. Why don't you suddenly become a grifter just because you? <laughs> well, and I and I think you know. There's also this. There's this old-fashioned academic prejudice that you talk to the public if you don't understand your subject very well. Right. Like, oh, you know, you're not publishing original research again for like 12 people to read because you you don't actually know this that well. So, but it's like, well, but this is actually just teaching on a larger scale, right? It's yeah. the same thing you do in an undergrad classroom. You take people who don't know that much about it as you do. Sometimes they know quite a bit, but they don't know as much about it as you do. And you guide them into understanding what you know as well as you can. So I, I've I've faced some some more hostility. I think probably the most was at Berkeley, but then Berkeley's a really snotty place. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not sure about the reputation. Like I, I don't have much of a I'm not tuned into the reputations of U.S. universities very well. But I don't know. Berkeley's up there, so it's it's kind of a snotty place for that kind of thing. Among Often among younger colleagues, though, uh, including on the tune track, and, and and none of this is is universal, right? You know, this people people have a variety of opinions, but the the sort of trends, often among younger colleagues, 
there's more acceptance of it. And um, usually when I was teaching, my students didn't even know my channel existed. Right. But if they did find it, they usually thought it was kind of neat. Okay, that's good. And they'd well, always, be like, be, cool. they'd always be like, how'd you, how'd you get so many followers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's one thing people say is, like even my dad says, it's such a niche thing. Like how, I suppose I'm not surprised that people are interested in it because I'm interested in it, so I know why you would be. But from the perspective of someone, I suppose, that, that maybe wasn't as interested, it seems surprising that so many people would um, crowd to it. But I think, I mean, at, at the moment, or maybe um, in the recent past that you're kind of taking off from, there has been a big sort of Viking trend in the public eye, hasn't there as well? Like the, the series yep. Vikings and things like that. And Assassin's They're Creed Valhalla, which, which you of course did work on. Um, a little bit. But no, it's, it's true. This stuff is huge right now. and. But you still, it's so hard to convince mainstream people that it's huge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember with, um, I mean, this has happened with so many different people with, with my publisher, with, with Boulder Bookstore, where I originally asked, like, could I, <laughs> could I get you all to distribute my signed books? And they're like, translations of Norse mythology. Like, <laughs> you don't understand how many requests we get for this. Yeah. Um, now they do. Yeah, people just don't, pe people outside of it don't understand that there's probably millions of people who are a potential audience for this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to take another question from down here. This one also uh, sort of off our topic today. So I'll just mention, um, if we discuss pre-runic symbols or Etruscan symbols, so I have a video called, I think it's actually just called The Origin of the Runes where I deal a little bit with um, potentially where the runes come from. So you can follow up on that. I, Here's I a, it, but that sounds very interesting. I'll watch that one after this. It's from probably two years ago. Uh, Andrew, or maybe three, Andrew Coleman, previous Crowdcast speaker, uh, asks, what do you think is the future of regional accents in Britain or America? Continual standardization or more divergence? That's a really interesting one. Um, I don't know. I think I think the trend that we've seen over the last hundred years or so, and this is not something I'm well versed in, so I'll try and look up I'll try and look up some study that agrees with what I've said here because it's just sort of hearsay. I think that the trend um, I, I, that I've had described to me has been that you get leveling of dialects regionally. But it's not necessarily an Anglosphere-wide leveling of dialects. So, for example, rather than having, you know, fifty or a hundred different dialects of Southern U.S. English, you kind of have one steadily leveling dialect of Southern U.S. English, as distinct from perhaps Northern English or uh, Northern U.S. English or Midwestern English or whatever. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that that might not correlate with people's personal experience, but I think that that broadly correlates with my experience in the U.K. Um, that there's becoming more of a pan-northern dialect rather than individual northern dialects. And certainly in the south, um, what, we, what we might think of as West Country dialects, which is kind of, I suppose, where the stereotypical pirate accent comes from. Uh, used to, there used to be sort of loads of varieties of that across the southeast and the southwest. And that's now uh, people my age and people a, a bit older than me broadly speak quite similarly to me so those dialects have kind of been leveled in a kind of southern leveling but there is i mean there are still sociolects and things like um what you might think of as a cockney dialect is still uh, prominent so I, i'm not sure it might it might be that certain dialect areas whether that be geographic areas or socio socioeconomic areas might kind of level within themselves but not necessarily across the Anglo split. I'm not sure. Do you, do you have any sort of instinct about that? I have thoughts about it. I I think one is that we're in a really unique situation now, we are, where for yeah. the first time, anyone could potentially, you know, hear people speaking 
12, 14 different accents of English in a day and possibly choose to imitate any of them for a variety of reasons, you know, we're exposed to so much. And the judgments about those different accents, I think, are probably the main thing that's going to determine what they're like going forward. One thing that I think about is the case of Norwegian. There's a ton of regional dialects. But when the Nynorsk written standard became a kind of um, rallying point for people who were interested in the dialects, I also have noticed that over the past several decades, those dialects have that are still more distinct from urban East Norwegian have tended to start coalescing more around something that's more like standard written Nynorsk. Okay. So, so there's still distinction, but the distinction becomes more of a bifurcation because of this identity thing that's wrapped up in the Nynorsk versus Bukmal question. And I think something kind of similar is happening in the United States. This is personal experience other people may have different experiences with. But I feel like we're bifurcating a little bit into kind of a more of an urban versus rural distinction. And the rural distinction is like rural areas outside of the south are picking up more southern features. Okay. I think it's I think people are sort of rallying to this rural like country music identity. I think this is a real thing. And they absorb more southern elements than they previously had. Um you know, there's speakers, I, I guess one way to put this is there's, there's speakers in Wyoming, which is a long way from the South, who say y'all now. You know, older people don't. But younger people are picking this stuff up. Again, I, I think it's like country music and other sort of like rural identity things. And it's so it's bifurcating in a weird way where it remains distinct, but not quite in the way that you would think. See, that, but I that, do. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think having had no personal experience with that as a child, beyond just television and things like that, I think that was kind of the impression I got, um, was that people from rural areas stereotypically were more likely to sound like how I imagined Southern US speakers sounding. So that's it's interesting to, to hear a native American English speaker sort of well, TV has done interesting things to this because I think TV has actually shaped that perception among the people who would actually speak that way, right? I think I think people watch, you know, shows uh, yeah. and and say, well, I like this character, I identify kind of with this character, and they actually will. I think they can that can actually back influence them. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of what's happening in Wyoming. Is Wyoming like you watch a show like Longmire? you know, 10 years ago, I would always kind of laugh and say, these people sound too Southern. Yeah. Now, Wyoming's actually kind of catching up to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I hear rural Californians who sound pretty Southern. Um, so I think there's some interesting things happening there. And a lot of it has to do with that sort of social, like, identity question in a way that has never even been possible before. Yeah. Do you think it started off as a kind of unfounded stereotype then before it became, before it started back in Oh, sure. Stuff? It probably started as a stereotype, but people have a, have adopted the stereotype. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not consciously, but I think that's part of what's happened. Yeah, I think people do. On very the, the the processes of sound change on an individual level are really interesting, and I don't know much about them. But I have, I mean, like I'll listen to recordings of myself talking when I was like twelve or something, and I sound different. You know, I have a different <laughs> accent and things like that. I don't know. Or like the Queen. I mean, I think there's analysis, analyses of the Queen, how she speaks. She has a slightly different phonology, well, not underlying phonology, but slightly different phonetic realizations now than she did, say, 60 years ago or so. Hmm. Slightly That's less interesting. RP. Yeah. Well, she's got a long life to, to, to play that out on. Yeah, it's surprising with someone as young as you. I think, I, I don't know to what extent it was deliberate, because I know, like, at school, because my mum had more of a kind of an estuary accent, so something, not not a Cockney accent, but something vaguely approaching a Cockney accent. And my dad is from the north, so I don't sound like either of them. And I think it was mm. in secondary school I started kind of, I think on some level consciously trying to level myself a little bit, where I talk, I used to talk a bit more like my mum, and I now 
talk a bit more like the people I went to school with. But I suppose huh. that that's I don't know. I suppose I mean that's just a personal case. That's just everybody has their own kind of their idiolect has its own kind of story. I think. Do you think you've always more or less spoken as you speak now? I don't know, because different people hear me differently, and I'm not always sure what they're hearing. Okay. Um, you know, my family has deep roots in, in Texas. A lot of my family is Texan exiles, I'll put it that way. So a lot of us have Texas features, and I definitely hear Texas features in my English. Um, but then so many people will say, well, I never would have thought that you had any roots in Texas because you don't sound like you're from Texas. Right. And then other people will say, I just can't stand to listen to your audiobook because you sound <laughs> well, Texas. I'm like, oh, like, so I don't know what, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's weird, so, there was a video I did where I tried to imitate a southern US accent, which maybe wasn't the most advisable thing to do. And a load of people said, oh, you've got this right. You, you sound just like somebody I know or something. And then a load of other people said, this is an insulting, you know, stereotype. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe it's a maybe it's a regional thing because i didn't want to say obviously i'm not going to say to the people who say you've got this accent wrong i'm not going to say actually i've got it right because that's just right. denying them their own knowledge of their own accent but did your grandfather was your grandfather texan if you don't mind me asking yeah and he um he had a very distinctive accent and actually a lot of his distinctive features are responsible for my distinctive features because i grew up you know i, I didn't grow up very much in texas but he he was such an influence on me that I subconsciously and consciously patterned myself after him. So I know I've got a lot of stuff because of him. Is that, is including, that the what stuff? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing everybody makes fun of me for. I like that. No, I, I like hearing that in modern, modern speakers. It's, you know, like I, I can remember I was in a, uh, I, I took a linguistics class as an undergrad and the professor asked the class something like, now do any of you say, which and which differently. She didn't say them differently. She said, do you, either, any of you say these two words differently? And I raised my hand. She's like, no, it's, I'm not asking if they're spelled differently. I'm asking if you actually pronounce them differently. I'm like, yeah, you know, this is, no one, no one does anymore, it seems like. But in Georgia, in Georgia, I would meet more people who made the, the distinction. I, I was going to say, I'm sure I've heard people within your kind of age bracket say it in videos and things <clears throat> like I, I never know if it's somebody imitating the accent and trying to put it on a little bit but or if it's or if it's a genuine survival of it but yeah it's certainly it's one of those because old english had a lot of those voiceless um word initial consonants yeah. like you could do it with l you could do it with r um but it's, I don't know, it's weird that Hua has been the one that's just held on until pretty much today. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it did in Scandinavian too. That's the only, uh, I mean, outside of Icelandic, that's the only like, cluster, like, well, it's not really even a cluster, but um, there were Swedish dialects uh, and even Icelandic dialects, really, that still said Hua into probably the 1600s, 1700s. Uh, there's some Icelandic speakers that still do it now, but Icelandic's a more complicated story. Is so somehow only, that Icelandic now. somehow that's a little bit more lasting than hla or hra. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if there's anything mechanical that that makes that. Um, okay. There's more minimal pairs. Yeah, I suppose there are. What? No, not what. Well, I suppose now what? Now you have what the measurement, but whale, whale, no whales. Um, no, I can't think of any like natural old minimal pairs. Now I think about well, it. This, whether, 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 which, yeah. which, um, there's another one. Yeah. Whales, whales, what that works. Um, and if you talk about the old English alphabet, when, when. Yeah. When that's true. <laughs> yeah. Our, so if we kept you too long, I just want to give you a chance, uh, at a, an hour 17, uh, we've got more questions. Are you doing good? Do you need? No, I'm doing fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, I want to. I want to. I want to be respectful of your time. Oh no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. Well, we have a question here. Another one from Mace who asks: um, Was the Anglo-Saxon conversion of Britain a mass migration event via invasion, or more gradual progression 
via individual migrant tribes invading the British Isles. So if gradual, could that lend more weight to the ideas of Celtic influence on Old English? Um, did, did you have something to say? No, go ahead. Okay. I don't, um, I don't, this is more your field. It's, it's not something I know a huge amount about beyond that ADNA stuff I mentioned earlier. Um, I tend to assume that these things are more to do with um, people moving, particularly in the case of Anglo-Saxons, um, people moving to secure better land or something like that, rather than um, tribes deciding en masse that we're going to go and um, we're going to go and take over this particular country. But I'm not. I'm not sure if that's. A th I think. I think maybe maybe that's just me assuming that because, um, for example, with something like the Romans, that was a cohesive um, people with a shared identity, who, who sort of part of that cultural identity, I suppose, was taking places and being imperial and things like that. Whereas um, West Germanic groups, to my understanding, did not have quite such a cohesive, you know, we are the West Germanic people, you know, we go around doing things with each other. You know, they were sort of, I mean, it's, it's hard to say anything about the groups during the migration period because there's so little written evidence, but I don't know, I could be wrong though. I could be wrong. I tend to assume it was, it was a gradual migration of people for the most part rather than uh, violent invasion, although there, were, there was clearly some violence. But sorry for not being able to give a more satisfactory answer. I, I suspect this is also probably more opportunistic than a lot of people would think about it being today, right? I mean, you have a situation where Britain has been under the protection of the Roman Empire. Suddenly it's not. Hmm. You, you have yeah. a climate that's reasonably familiar to people from northern Germany, southern Denmark, the islands off of the Netherlands, it's not it's not that far. It's not like crossing the Atlantic. Yeah. And you see a place where you know, you can go in and, and martially be in a better position than the people that are already there. And then there's also the theory that maybe there was actually an epidemic going around the the British population at about that time. Oh, really? Okay. I've, yeah, okay. I've read that a couple of places. There's apparently if I, I'll, I'll try to find you an actual reference for this, but apparently there's some evidence that there was a plague that hit the the population of Britain around that time. So there's, yeah, I think a lot of it's just opportunistic and, and that can happen, you know, maybe not too differently from the way it happened in the U S where originally, you know, maybe you do intend or as far as you know, to stay in kind of this Eastern seaboard area, but then, well, population growth comes with, you know, good farming conditions and yeah. you know other chances like that your population's growing i mean you just kind of keep going and the border keeps receding yeah yeah i think the us is probably a very good analogy both in terms of that and in terms of maybe in terms of linguistic features as well because i've been doing a i did a video a little while ago which was sort of the development of a london accent over six or seven hundred years or so and i've been trying to do a a us one which is difficult on the basis that there are that US accents have, I think, historically had more of a tendency tendency to be non-regional, to be like class, you know, socioelect kind of things rather than regional things, as well as regional accents developing from stuff as well. Um, so it's been difficult to do that on the basis that you can't pick a region and just sort of have a clear, uninfluenced um, line from from colonial. I suppose, British English to modern American English. But um, I think um, as early as the 1950s, people have been suggesting that maybe, I would agree that the Anglo-Saxon, the, the sort of later Anglo-Saxon dialects were not continuations of continental dialects, but there was mm -hmm. a kind of leveling in the prehistoric period and then a diversification into Northumbrian and Mercian and so on. Um, and I, I think maybe the same happened in the US, although I've not researched it enough to know, know for certain, in the, in the sense that I'm not sure whether there's any particular part of the US, for example, that I would associate more with having Scottish derived features than Southern English derived features, just as an example. Right. 
Yeah. Although people love to say things like, you know, the Tide Islands off of the Carolinas speak Elizabethan English and that kind of thing. I, I do um, find the accent interesting, even even if the Elizabethan comparison is, is maybe a bit overblown. I find it very interesting how... Oh, it is. Chris actually makes an interesting point, going back to another question a little <laughs> bit. Um, maybe the identity question helped eliminate Brythonic in Anglo-Saxon dominated areas. They didn't want to sound like an enemy or a slave. Possibly. Speculative, but possible. You know, yeah. who knows what the identity questions of the past were? Yeah, there's, that's a very interesting suggestion because, um, as you say, if, the, if there was a prestige, um, I don't know how long it would take for local West Germanic dialects to, to establish themselves as kind of prestige dialects in a in a. Um, a kind of landscape of uh, Britonic dialect, but that yeah, you could easily imagine somebody not wanting to come across as um, uh, an enemy. I'm trying to think of an example of a later kind of Britonic um, figure trying to insert themselves into an Anglo-Saxon lineage, because um, I think me and my friend were talking about it recently. I can't I, I can't think of an example, but if I if I do, I'll email it to you. Um, uh, see, Chris has another question from down in the ask a question section. Uh, why did the case system die in English? Do you have a theory about that? Why? Um, well, I think the, the case and gender systems kind of go together in this, in, in this respect, because um, a lot of information about case and gender is stored in uh, word endings. And in the Germanic languages, there's a tendency for stress to be kind of on the initial uh, syllable of the stem of the word, so an ending is gonna is gonna be a uh, kind of area of relatively weak stress, or sometimes the weakest level of stress. So um, that's if, for example, adjective endings contained a lot of information about um, case and gender. So if, if if a noun was masculine and being used in the, the accusative um, case, then the any adjective describing it, the ending of that adjective would, would have to agree with the, the gender in the case of the noun. So if those endings become weaker and become indistinct, then that's how you lose things like case and gender. And of course, it wasn't just endings, it was also the definite article, um, the, which I'm not, I'm not actually sure how that leveled. Um, and then also you had the tendency to use pronouns, like if a, if a noun was masculine and you'd refer back to the pronoun, then you'd use he rather than it. Um, mm. But I think endings was a big part of it. So I think that starts in West Saxon uh, in the sort of 10th century, 11th century. Um, you start to see these endings becoming uh, confused with each other in spelling. So you get confusion of um endings and un endings and things like right. that where the vowels in those endings and sometimes the consonants, if they're nasal, uh, tend to disappear. Uh, not disappear, but the distinctions between them tend to disappear. So I think in the case of nasal consonants, one reason for that might be something like, um, if the vowels U and A have merged as something more central, and then you, you sometimes get the loss of a, a nasal consonant because the vowel nasalizes and there's some kind of com compensatory lengthening or something, so maybe I don't know, maybe maybe n and m just disappeared into a nasalization of the vowel and then that vowel got denasalized or something. I'm not sure. But I think, yeah, that the less distinct those endings get, the less meaningful ideas about case and gender become. Because because if you're not distinguishing between them in speech, then then they're not they don't really exist, if you see what I mean. Right. So, I think you're exactly right. That it's that it's driven by that phonetic change. I think, yeah. Has, has anything like that happened in, in the Scandinavian languages? Um, not to the same degree in most dialects. Um, most Scandinavian languages on the continent have two genders now, masculine and feminine fall together, and then you have neuter. Okay. Um, and to some extent, the masculine and feminine falling together is because of phonetic change too. Okay. Um, and in none of these languages do you have the super obvious distinctions that you have. And, and you mentioned the example of Spanish earlier, where you know, masculine is O, feminine is A. Ah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Something that's that marked makes it very easy to maintain the system. Yeah. Right. But in but in languages that just 
you know, rip away their final syllables every couple hundred years. Yeah. You know, that <laughs> yeah. stuff. It's a good description. Just, just, I mean, that's what happens over time. It is, it is what happens, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we have... But I, Karakas just gave me a message and said, remember, you can't do this for more than two hours. Okay. Um, <laughs> so any anytime you need to to go, feel free to go. I'm just taking questions oh, still. No, I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Though. If you need to go, then go, go as well. Oh, okay. I just, just, just try to be courteous. Yeah, right. Okay. So Martha asked a question that I don't know very much about. Uh, I don't know about you. She says, could... Um, does Y chromosome or DNA evidence give any insight into the migration or settlement? I'm not sure about that, I'm afraid. Any comment I made would probably turn out to be wrong. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm in about the same place. Um, I just don't know that stuff well. No. Um, Auburn asks, speaking of, going back to something we were talking about with the minimal pair, weather, weather, was weather a castrated ram ever pronounced differently from weather like the sky? I think it was even in early mo earlier modern English because my grandfather would make distinctions between words like that. Would he? Um, what, what was so, it like? So he consistently, if there was an E-A vowel, he had a consistently different realization for that. He would say head, weather, right? It was a different... It was different from, um, you know, a pet or yeah. set something down. It was it, way other or head. Yeah. Um, actually, I was really kind of touched. I'm obsessed with the uh, mid 20th century California poet Robinson Jeffers. Mm -hmm. And there's a few recordings of him on YouTube. And if you listen to him, he does the same thing my grandfather did, where he will say the head. Yeah. Um, so that's that's that was actually apparently distinct. I, have you ever heard that in England? I I haven't heard that in particular, but it's interesting what you say about e a, the the vowel that's spelled e a, um, because that used to be, um, it, it was on the path to becoming e, to like long. Well, I suppose long, tense rather than lax e. So in some Northern English dialects and Scots dialects, you have head dead bred, pronounced heed, deed, breed. So there's clearly, um, to some extent, uh, that distinction has been preserved in some dialects. And it's, it's, it's not surprising to hear it's been preserved in, in some dialects in the US either. So um, I'm not actually sure when, uh, I think it, I, I get the, I get the feeling that that must have, that, that, uh, that, F in dead and bread and things like that must have come about in the Middle English period because at that point those words was, were, were pronounced with a longer version of the F vowel that we now have, at least in mm. South of England. So you dead, bread, things like that. <clears throat> um, so my instinct would be that it probably shortened in certain conditions, possibly before de, although I'm not sure I'd, you'd have to look at the, all the words it occurred in. Mm. Um, in middle English and then maybe went into the vowel shift with a short vowel and so it wasn't affected by it. But then in some dialects, it maintained the distinction maybe. Um, yeah, I wonder what the conditioning factors are because it, it noted how, in, do you know in those areas you're talking about in, in the North, how they would say early? That's an or interesting. Earth? I, I would say, um, so my, gran, my grandfather, even if he was talking quite broadly with another person from the area would probably just say early or earth. I'm not, I'm not imitating the accent very well, but I think um, you do have a kind of falling together of certain vowels um, before R in the early modern mm -hmm. period. So um, that's, that's things that were short vowels uh, with R following them. So for example, uh, I think some people call it the nurse merger and some people call it the fur, fur, fern merger. So fur is in the mm -hmm. tree, was pronounced fear. Fur is in the animal thing, was pronounced fur. And then fern as in the, you know, the, the plant was pronounced fern. And then there was a merger of those which probably happened in two stages. So I think fear and fur fell together first as something like far. And then later fern joined those. 
So it could be it could be just one of those things where valves before are kind of get protected and then change differently. But yeah, you'd have to look further into that, I think. I, I'm trying to think of an example of a word with EA that's now E eh, that um that doesn't end in D. Um Well weather. Feather. Weather, yeah, that's true. Yeah, actually feather weather, yeah. Maybe it's an alveolar thing. Or a dental, Maybe. I suppose, isn't it? Dental rather than alveolar, but yeah, that's peak, like mountain peak, but then that's pronounced everywhere with the E vowel. Um, huh. Yeah, this is something I'd have to think about more and dig for more yeah, examples of. Reed and as well, which has a D at the end. Reed. But it's, but it's reed. And reed and uh, red, that, that's a weird minimal pair, actually. Yeah, but, it is. But, yeah, because the past tense red, which, I, which my grandfather, I think, would say red. Um, yeah, that's interesting. You know, and then and then actually, I'd also point out I, there are Scottish and Irish speakers who I'm pretty sure don't even have any part of that fear for fire and merger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In, in Ireland, um, and probably in Scotland as well. Yeah, the, yeah, definitely in Ireland. That's it's 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 so interesting how these things can actually hold on in some areas that um, is, yeah. you know originally weren't even English-speaking areas. I think some of the earliest evidence for that 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 change in um, in southeastern English is is documents mocking Irish speakers for maintaining the distinction um, between. Um, I think the ones they were referring to, it sounded like they had the merger between fear and for, but not the fairing merging in. So so they were mocked for having that distinction. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder what it's like to be mocked for having distinctions in one speech <laughs> <laughs> that others have lost. <laughs> I'm sorry about um, that. <laughs> sorry you have to no. suffer. Oh, it's... I, I, I've been a teenager. It's been worse. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, okay, hold on. I just lost where I was in this. Okay, Julia asked about crafting or artwork or reconstructing old instruments. I don't know if that's a question for us or for someone else, because I'm trying to find questions. Um, maybe she'll come back and, and elaborate about that. Mace asked, um, of the Northern English accents like Cumbrian, Geordie, Scouse, is that right? Or Scouse. Yorkshire, Scouse, which has retained the most phonological links with Old English? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, it's hard because where some dialects are um, conservative in one regard, they're, they're probably quite um, innovative in another regard. So Geordie still has hoose and moose uh, for broader speakers for house and mouse, but also um, uh, words like stone and bone and things like that often have this yeah, um, I suppose, sequence. So stien, bien, uh, and yem, and yen for home and one. So that, and that's definitely not something that was present in Old English. That's an innovation that's um, that's happened around the Scottish border. So I, I think Scouse is probably um, an example of one that is not very that, that is very innovative, um, but in a really interesting way. So it's it's not like having a having a dialect that's not quite so conservative is a bad thing or anything like that. It doesn't make it less good or anything. But um, I think because of the, the amount of Irish immigration into um, Liverpool and places with, with that Scouse dialect, it's become extremely differentiated. So you have um, a lot of lenition and affrication of consonants, and you have some weird vowel changes. You have uh, the nurse there merger, which I find really interesting because, hmm. because it kind of happens twofold. I, you know, some speakers merge both words to the nurse end of the spectrum, like nurse the. And then some speakers merge merge them to the there end of the spectrum, like Ness there. Um, huh. so that's an interesting one that I've not heard in any other. Or actually, I suppose in Lancashire that does that does kind of exist in some places. But yeah, I think maybe it's really it's really hard to say. I think um, I suppose northern dialects have have a slight. Um, edge in terms of uh, cons conservativity because they don't have the foot strut split 
um, so foot and strut are still pronounced to rhyme with each other. But of those dialects, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's anyone that's more conservative than the others. I think they've just diverged in different different ways. People ask about this in Scandinavian too, of course, mm -hmm. and I'm always reaching for paleontology metaphors. Um, yeah. So my paleontology metaphor for this is, you know, which one is more conservative or archaic, a fish or an insect? Yeah. Because both presumably come from an ocean dwelling invertebrate ancestor. Yeah. Well, the fish is still in the ocean, but it's mm -hmm. got a spine. The yeah. insect still doesn't have a spine, but it's on the land. So which yeah. one is more archaic? It's just it's just trade-offs and features. You never end up having, you know, uh, like this, I, I don't know if it's a Hollywood conception, but a kind of popular conception that like there's a place where people just get isolated and just their language never changes. Yeah, yeah. You know, that just doesn't happen. So maybe it's the same um, with things like um, uh, com complexity as well, because modern Germanic languages have a tendency towards, I don't know if this is the case for all of them, but they have a tendency towards being more analytic. Um, mm -hmm. And so everybody nowadays speaks a more analytic language than their ancestors a thousand years ago might have done. It, it looks as though these historical languages were more complex, whereas in reality, they were just complex in different ways. Um, right. So more inflectional morphology, less rigid word order and stuff like that. Um, right, the complexity is just coded somewhere different in the system. Yeah, yeah, and we don't notice its complexity because it's it's natural to us. Right. But yeah. Yeah. I, I I try to make these points all the time, um, but people are always kind of looking for that like oldest language. It's like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, there's something old about what you're saying. I mean, heck, modern English is incredibly conservative or archaic in terms of the interdental fricatives. Yeah. So the and what or in well. terms. Yeah, right. W, because actually, I think modern English is one of the very few Indo-European languages that still retains the W from yeah. Proto-Indo-European. Yeah. So there you so, go. Maybe we're maybe we're problem. the true fossil language. <laughs> maybe we're the, the, the most conservative. That's yeah. that's that's the argument I'm going to make on YouTube. No one will shout at me. <laughs> I'm sure like people within your field will shout at you, but that will right. probably happen. That will probably happen. In, in the in the interest of con conservativity, even though we, we've just said there's no no um, dialect or language that's more universally more conservative, aren't there still some Scandinavian dialects with nasals in some positions? Yep. Yeah, that's Elf cool. Dalian, um, so called. I think people call it that because it sounds like Elf. Um, <laughs> they always but, wanted to. <laughs> yeah, the, the the conservative dialects of Dalarna, Sweden. Have some incredibly conservative features like they still have w not really? v yep um so you know we is uh is is weird um that's nice that kind of thing they still have four cases um but then they have a lot of you know weird changes too mm -hmm. um but yeah that's true that there are some surprising archaic features out that way and that dialect or really language is is dying. I mean, young people just aren't picking it up. Right. Even as the even as the internet gets obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure maybe there'll be like an uplift as they realize people are obsessed with it. There'll be a load of YouTubers that are like, I speak Old Norse, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that person's actually out there, and I just haven't seen it. Um, yeah. But but no, that's a that's a really cool set of dialects, and then you can find. I mean. In Norway, you can find some really cool archaic stuff. I mean, there's dialects that traditionally have, have kept the distinction between singular and plural verbs, which is lost okay. mostly on the continent. Yeah. Um, you can actually find Norwegian dialects with ev, um, a few in the Northwest. So, you know, there's the stuff is scattered all over the place. Yeah, yeah. I think there are some West Germanic varieties that, that have were, not, not as were, but as a, something like a labiodental approximant or something like that as distinct yeah, I, think, from, but, but. I think some frisian and i think maybe yeah. some dutch that yeah i right. think um let's see chris asked is beowulf a good example of a typical bardic performance or a unique 
and uniquely long work? Um, I'm not. I'm not as familiar with Beowulf as I, I as I ought to be, um, in terms of its poetic meter and stuff. Um, I think it accords broadly to um, what you would expect from Anglo-Saxon alliterative poetry, but I don't know. If, if, I don't know. If, for example, the, the sort of plot structure is is what you would expect because it's it's unusually long for a text that we have preserved. But that that might just be because because of preservation bias rather than because of it being actually uniquely long among old English. Um, oral tradition, if it was oral tradition, which is still still debated. Um, but do you have any sort of input on that? I don't know. I mean, it's not really my department. Um, I would I would say that Haliond in Old Saxon on the continent is a work of not dissimilar length and structure and style, although the plot is very different because Haliond is a reworking of the New Testament um, yeah. or the Gospels. Um, you know, I think that it's a pretty unique, from what I, from what is preserved, a pretty yeah. unique um, artistic vision. Yeah. But I don't know if its structure and style are unique, and, and we don't know, like you said, if it's a preservation issue or not. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do like the idea that throughout, because it's set in Scandinavia, in. in I think there's there's been some suggestion that there's a particular place in like the island of Zealand that that it, that, that Heldort is supposed to be um, because of the people that the, the people that are mentioned like Kjorsgard and people like that who I think turn up in um, which is one of the sagas I think. Um, Rob Saga Kraka, yeah, that's Saga Rob Kraka, which my translation of forthcoming in September. I'll be I'll be purchasing that. Um, oh, thank you. It's it's. <laughs> I, I talk a little bit about the Beowulf parallels in the intro. Um, that would be, be very nice to read. I, I was it was fun. Say, was it fun to compile? It was. Um, and it's funny how much Beowulf and Rolf Kraki are like photo negatives of each other. Because okay. so Hrothgar is the king in Denmark in Beowulf, and we hear about his nephew Hrothulf. Okay, yeah. so we got Hrothgar and Hrothulf. We hear almost nothing about Hrothulf. He's just there. Hrothulf is the same as Old Norse Hrolf, mm. and Hrothgar is the same as Old Norse Hroar. Yeah. And so in Hrolf Kraki, it's the nephew who's the king that we hear all about, and the uncle's the one that's just like mentioned, but not really part of it. Yeah. So we have this weird uncle nephew switch yeah. in terms yeah. of importance. Um, but in this, in both stories, you have like, someone who shows up from Geatland or Yetaland, yeah. right? kills a monster i mean it's there's there's an older story underlying both of these for for sure and uh and it's not just the broad strains of the folk tale called the 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 bear's son which peter jorgensen of course wrote so much about back in his back in the day i actually took a class at peter jorgensen once really but that's getting a field yeah he taught at the university of georgia okay i was well, and actually my master's thesis was his last professional obligation. He got up. What's a market? Yeah. For, yeah. For yeah. He, well, he came. He was part of my committee, so he came to my thesis defense, signed off on it, left for Costa Rica, and no one has heard from him <laughs> since. <laughs> so, you know, I I respect that. Just shows well, up in his paper ten years later with a mustache or something. I I hope he's happy wherever, whatever's going on in his life. Um, I don't see more questions right now. We're coming up against our two hour barrier. I think this is a pretty good time to call it. Yeah. And thank you so much for taking so much time with us and all thank these great answers to questions. Thank you for inviting me on. It's been absolutely fantastic. I was nervous, but it's been, it's been very fun and relaxed. It's good. Well, and it's been great to be in touch with you. And um, I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward to this collaboration we got going on. I, I think we can actually get that put together um, in pretty good time. So yeah, I think we'll um, thank you everybody for your coming. Thank you for your questions. Thank, thank you, you for your support. Sorry for not scrolling through the thing more. I've been I've been focusing on the, the stream rather than the comments. So sorry if I've it's, anything that, that's, that's, um, that's been said. It is hard. Um, Andres asked if you are going to start a Patreon. 
I might I might end up doing at some point when I when I um, leave university and um, I'll, I'll want to get like a job in commercial archaeology or something. But if if I made that part time and then spent the rest of the time doing videos or something, then I could might see how Patreon works then. But yeah. But I wouldn't want to. I, I, I wouldn't know what to put on it as you know, like re, you put rewards and things, don't you? So I, I wouldn't know how to do. It. Oh, that is that is hard to figure out. Yeah. I mean, actually, one of one of my big rewards is you get to have conversations with people like you on this crowdcast. <laughs> um, but it takes me. <laughs> it takes a long time to get that ball rolling. But once it's rolling, I mean, it really has changed my life. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it seems like a, a good way of having people kind of volunteer to contribute if they want to contribute, but not have to if they, yeah, if they don't have the capacity or, yeah. Oh, Stella said, thank you for writing. Thank you, Stella, for re responding, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get in contact. Well, Stella is, Stella keeps this channel afloat. <laughs> like, <laughs> at this point, I couldn't manage it alone. Well, yeah. again, thank you so very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for your support. And uh, see everyone soon.